Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Robin Archer, and I'm the director of the Ralph Miliband program here at the London School of Economics. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our discussion this afternoon on social solidarity and the virus. It's, it's often been said that big exogenous shocks like the COVID virus have had the potential, at least, to generate a renewed sense of social solidarity and that the consequences of that can be important for progressive social and political change. And so we, what we wanted to do today was to find out what we currently know about changing public attitudes and what some of their consequences might be. And we've got an excellent panel here with us today um, at the slightly unusual time of three o'clock um, for our public lecture and panel. I'm going to introduce both our speakers in the order in which they speak, and they're both going to speak one after the other. First of all, uh, Tim Dixon, who's the co-founder of the More in Common group, which aims to analyse the sort of growing political polarisation and social fracturing that we're all familiar with in the contemporary world of the established democracies. The organisation has offices in, I think, four, four countries, and it sort of places important weight, at least in my reading of it, on gathering solid empirical evidence on which to base its findings. And the research that they've produced has been widely commented on um, in the media, notably late last year, a report called The New Normal, which was based on a multi-state uh, survey data. Well, uh, Tim trained as an economist, and I think also as a lawyer, is that, is that right? Um, and he's got a wealth of political experience as well as research and scholarly experience. He was an economic advisor and also the chief speechwriter to no less than two Australian Labor Prime Ministers. Um, and he's also since then been involved in organising a range of different social movements. Professor Kate Pickett is Professor of Epidemiology at the University of York, and she trained in Cambridge, in Cornell, and at uh, Berkeley, and she has won numerous honours and prestigious fellowships for her wide range of research uh, activities. I think it's probably fair to say that she reached a sort of new level of, of well-knownness um, with her book, The Spirit Level, which she co-authored. And that, that book made a, a powerful impact in a broader popular consciousness. You can see that in the way that it was voted as one of the top 10 books of the decade by the New Statesman, or it was chosen as publication of the year by the Political Studies Association, and it's been translated into, well, I don't know, it's probably a moving target, but at least 23 languages, maybe, maybe it's now more. Um, and she's built on that work more recently with also her co-authored book, The Inner Level. Well, um, Kate is also uh, involved in a number of organisations, notably the Equality Trust, which she uh, co-founded, and she's the chair of the Greater Manchester Inequalities Commission, which is due to report in just a matter of weeks. So we're particularly grateful to her for stopping writing that report and coming and speaking to us today. Well, each of our speakers is going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have a good chunk of time for questions and discussion. If you do have a question, please pop it in the chat um, and just say who you are and where you're from so we can announce it because the audience likes to, likes to know um, who's asking questions. Um, and we will try to go through as many of those as we can, but of course we can't promise to go through each and every one. So, I mean, the normal thing to do now would be to say, join me in welcoming our speakers, but I know you can't do that, so I will metaphorically welcome our speakers on behalf of all of you, and thank you very much both for coming. And we'll start um, with Tim Dixon and then here, Professor Kate Pickett. Thank you both very much. Thank you very much, Robin, and it's uh, it's a, an honour to join the program. Um, I'm especially delighted to join with uh, Professor Pickett because Back in the days when I was working in the Prime Minister's office in Australia 2009, when we were dealing with the financial crisis and its, its fallout, um, the spirit level came out and it was fantastic for us because we were making the case internally that uh, tackling inequality was, was not just about economics, but it was about the well-being of the country and it related to a range of different reform agendas that we were working on, the health uh, um, predominant among them. Um, and it was, uh, in a way, the way that I think about the um, Kate's work is that it, 
was kind of five years ahead of where the, the OECD's shift to talking about inclusive growth, that it really was a milestone in the shifting uh, of how we think about economics. And I recently, I now live in West Yorkshire, recently moved out of London up here as a, one of the pandemic refugees. Uh, and when I was unpacking my piles and piles of books, which you can partly see behind me, I discovered I had not one, but two copies of, uh, of Kate's book. Um, and I think that's probably a reflection that I wanted both a paperback and a hardback just to make sure that there wasn't anything I was missing out. But uh, anyway, it's terrific to, 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 to join. The, the, the vantage point on which um, I'm approaching this conversation is the work that I do with More in Common, as, as Rob, Robin mentioned. And, and our lens on these issues of, the, of COVID and its impact and the larger questions about where we are as a society um, comes from looking at the forces that are driving people apart, driving societies apart, with something of a comparative lens. We're in the UK and the US and France and Germany. We have a really strong evidence base. We bring a lot of social psychology into our work, but we're not really a pure think tank because our work is, we're really focused on what's the solutions and how do you sort of turn, get good insights into what's driving division, but then turn that into practical action. So I'm gonna draw on some of that research as we talk about um, the, uh, the where we think things are going uh, in the next little while. Uh, but the, the, the sort of bottom line from our, our work uh, for the UK is that the picture we, we've come up with from our research, the Britain's Choice study that we released last year, is a good bit more positive, I think, than what the, the sort of dominant media narrative has been about the state of polarisation and division. And it's very easy for us to look at the US and then kind of think that because some similar forces are at play uh, within our society here, that the, that the same forces are um, at play and that that we're you know, heading into the same kind of profound polarization. So that's a little bit of what we'll be talking about. Um, but I think you know, the, the larger picture as we think about the, uh, the issue of social solidarity and the impacts of, the, of, of COVID-19 is that we, we have been facing the, a, a very powerful set of centrifugal forces uh, over the last few years. And you can emphasize particular ones of those. You can talk about economic inequality and the regional dimensions of that, for example, very prominent during Brexit. You can talk about cultural uh, forces of, of change, <coughs> generational and the, uh, the different makeup, the changing makeup of our population. You can talk about social media and the disinformation and the media environment. They're all factors. Uh, there's a lot more about the loss of trust in institutions, loss of faith in democracy, kind of as well. I think the underperformance of, of, uh, of major political parties um, in, in, recent, in the recent decades, probably a sort of absence of leadership. You know, there's a, there's a whole range of factors that are driving our societies apart and weakening the forces that hold us together. Um, and it was all of that that prompted the setup of More in Common and the work that we're doing. And we're trying to think of what the solutions are. So thinking in a, in a practical sense, um, how do you counter those forces of division? And so we're building a range of different responses to that. Um, but what I'd like to bring in is something of that comparative lens with, with a focus on the UK um, in these remarks. Uh, I will share some specific uh, data shortly. We've been doing waves of research, really going back to the beginning of uh, 2020, in fact, prior to the pandemic, um, right up to the last few weeks. And we've got a lot more work sort of coming up in the next few months as well. Uh, but I want to highlight five points um, to stimulate the, the questions and the conversation here. The first is to say that there's elements of the pandemic that are unifying um, and show our commonality, and there's other elements that highlight our differences. And you can focus on sort of one or, or the other. The unifying elements are that we have, in a very unusual way, uh, rather like a wartime experience, as a whole society, our lives have been uh, turned upside down uh, by this. Uh, pandemic and obviously that translates into really specific things about the way that that affects people who live alone for example people who are parenting uh, with children in the house and also trying to work people who are on the front line and exposed to the the health dangers uh, and there there is something that's unifying in this common experience of you know, for years to come we'll all have COVID stories that we can share at the same time the the pandemic does highlight differences uh, among us, the disproportionate impact uh, 
that the uh, pandemic has on different groups within the community, particularly blue collar workers, people who don't who aren't able to work from home. I think it's one way in which the furlough scheme has been so important because you haven't got a story of dramatically different economic conditions through the pandemic. I mean, less and less so, uh, at least in the UK uh, compared to other countries. Um, and so there's a sense of um, we've tried to bridge one that, that really profound divide, but it might still be a, a very significant division emerging from the crisis. Uh, but there are specific groups within the community that are much more affected. Um, and of course, you know, health workers are one of the most obvious ones. Um, but there is there are divisions that you can see may open up further as we go into the, the post pandemic period. I would say that as just an overall remark, so far, in terms of the way that people are experiencing, have experienced the first 12 months of, of COVID, the unifying uh, dimensions of this experience, or the common dimensions of this experience, have been more powerful than the dividing uh, uh, effects. Um, but it, obviously, there are, for some people, that's not true. But overall, in terms of the whole population and the groups that we've been talking to, I think there has been more of a story of commonality. Certainly, the themes that emerge um, from our research about people's perception of more concern um, for others, uh, their, their perceptions of other people's kindness in the UK. Um, the UK has been stronger than most other countries uh, on those scores. The second thing to say is that the pandemic does also plant the seeds of division. Um, as well as uh, give us uh, um, a sense of common experiences that, and, and shared experiences that, that transcend some of the things that, uh, that set us apart from each other. With More in Common's work, we do a lot to track us versus them sentiment in different ways uh, across countries. Um, and what's striking, one of the lessons that conflict experts will tell you to watch out for in times of big change is where the blame and culpability narratives are emerging. And so far, what's striking is there isn't really a strong story of blame and culpability narratives, especially not in the UK, but actually sort of more generally across Western societies. For example, it could have been that uh, immigrants or some particular groups within our community uh, are blamed more. And there's certainly been efforts by far-right forces online to do that, but it hasn't really got much, much traction. And actually, even even in terms of an anti-government narrative, despite the fact that there's many elements of the UK government's response that have really um, uh, failed and been un unsuccessful. Um, what we really picked up in the conversations, we had a lot of one-to-one -one conversations and group conversations throughout the last year, as well as large uh, representative national surveys. And it really struck me how people, most Brits didn't want to be judgmental of the government. A lot of people were willing to say, look, uh, I think they've, they've made, they've stuffed these things up, they've got things wrong, but then I wouldn't want to be in their shoes, I wouldn't want to be doing the same things then. That's different to the US, where there's much more of a political polarised response, where people will fall into line with their side of the um, uh, political fence. But the experience, in terms of thinking about where this is going in the future, and this is why it's too early to really draw a judgement about the impacts of, uh, of um, the pandemic, just think about the global financial crisis back in 2008, 2009. You couldn't have made a judgment about its effect a year on from the, its first impacts. Um, you know, Tea Party uh, emerged in 2010 with the big effects in the midterm elections then. Most of the wave of authoritarian populism that was very related to the, the fallout from austerity and from the uh, financial crisis really came some years after. So I think it's just too early, frankly, to, to know. Um, and that's why with some of our work, we're trying to look for what are the best early warning signals to be able to pick up who's being blamed, whether communities, parts of community are being set against each other um, in the future. And certainly the difficult period of economic recovery and reconstruction is going to present real challenges there. The third thing to say is that one reason for hope is that while the forces of division are strong and are growing, there is actually a lot of common ground. Uh, and I think that's particularly true um, in the UK. Um, it's not just that we have 51% agreement on a lot of things. We actually have three in four people, uh, even as much as four fifths agreement on a lot of issues that are often regarded as being debatable or, um, or possibly controversial. So I wanna give a few examples now, and this is where I'm gonna um, share some uh, data just to give some sense of the commonality of experience um, and people's uh, sense of uh, 
uh, agreement around the, the big issues facing the UK for the future. So firstly, just looking at uh, people's experience of uh, the, the crisis, the UK more than, we, we did this across um, six countries. We also uh, have some data, not all of this for, for the US. The UK is uh, the country where three and five, more than any other country, people felt the support and care of others. Uh, again, the, had the highest numbers of people feeling that people in our country care about each other. If we look at um, people's perception of division, even though now this is just going from a few weeks ago when we asked the question again, uh, is the country divided or united? Um, we, we do very strongly perceive the country to be divided, but a fair bit less than what we, we did a year ago before the, the, the pandemic. Um, the numbers of feeling the country is united has gone from 13 to 20%. So a long way to go, but the pandemic hasn't accentuated the divisions that we had coming out of uh, Brexit. Uh, we asked this question about, and this is a really good social solidarity question, we've seen a big change in the months after the pandemic hit, where people shifted from majority uh, two to one, thinking that it's an everyone for themselves society to we look after each other. And that, I mean, there's a very, very big shift in those months afterwards, but you can see how that's, those gains have been lost. I, I wonder a little bit whether there's a winter effect here, <laughs> asking this question of people in the middle of a dark grey winter. Um, but we actually, at the, the question we asked uh, just a few weeks ago gave us exactly the same numbers as a year ago. So there was a big burst of social solidarity, solidarity. There's been some loss of that, but I'll show as well that there have been some gains that have been sustained. Around thinking about the, uh, the, the way in which we should approach the future, do we want to return to normal, to return to the pre-pandemic normal, or do we want change? The UK, more than any of these uh, seven countries with major Western uh, democracies, um, has a sense of wanting change, an appetite for change. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. I want to just flag for you, if you're interested to understand more about our research, we have done a segmentation of uh, the country, as we've done in France, Germany, and the United States as well. We think it's you get a much richer understanding of the country when you look at people's underlying beliefs, their worldview, their sense of identity, and you see such a consistent pattern commonality in people's responses when you look at the, the, the sort of coherence of their worldview. And we, we found seven segments of the population not distinguished by demographics at all and not distinguished by their views on politics, but actually by their underlying beliefs. And there's a whole bunch of social psychology behind that. But this is just the story of those seven. Very, very crudely, it's a kind of left to right uh, analysis. But, uh, you know, as I say, it's kind of the left and right thing really is an identity that only about one in three, less than one in three people really relate to. So there's a rich story here, but I just want to show that in order to um, demonstrate that there is a surprising amount of common ground. So for example, around making changes to the country, your most conservative group, the backbone conservatives, 55% feel that it is a time for change. Only one of our seven population segments uh, doesn't have a majority uh, thinking that way. In terms of people's experience of community, there are some groups where there's been less experience of community, less, less sense of solidarity, but you see the disengaged battle is there. It's a more blue collar working class, very low trust group. Um, so feels the systems failed them, doesn't have a very strong sense of agency. It's the, it's the segment that actually has the highest proportion of uh, BAME uh, population. Um, but what's interesting there is that this is not a story where, oh, it's only the middle classes who have had a, a sense of mutual support. We've actually found the biggest shift in positive sentiment about uh, each other has come among uh, the disengaged groups, the ones that tend to be lowest trust. So that's actually one of the reasons why I think the story is more positive than what you might assume. Uh, we've got agreement um, uh, of three and four uh, that inequality is a very serious problem um, in the UK. We've similarly got 85% agreement that climate change is something that concerns all of us regardless of our politics. And again, like look at those numbers. It's not, this is not at all a left-right divide, even though certainly the, the progressive activist group um, has that almost as an article of faith, almost 100% of them uh, agree with that proposition. But 81% of, uh, of the backbone conservative group uh, do as well. And there's more nuance in these segments we don't have time to, to look at. We might want to visit in some of the questions. But one of the surprises is uh, from our work is just how much uh, there is a frustration about how power is centralised in the UK. And I think this is a common ground agenda for the future. 
Um, 80% of people across the country feel that too much is decided in London. It's agreement there in every group. The Loyal Nationals, which is the most kind of, it's a blue collar, very pro-Brexit, sort of anti-immigration, very strong and group identity, they, they, and, and very much a red wall sort of story. They have the nine and 10 of that, but it is a, it's a common ground proposition. You know, even three in five people in London agree that too much is decided in London. Another indicator that sometimes we get a real distorted picture of the extent of division in our community. You know, we've heard a lot from the lockdown protesters. That, Look at this, we asked this question, um, have anti-lockdown protesters have been a force for good in, our, in British society? Only 5%, one in 20 people believe that. And only 7% of conservatives, there's more support there from, than among uh, Labor and SNP and Lib Dem supporters, but it's just not a sentiment that is uh, shared by the vast majority of the population. Uh, in terms of people's experience of community, this is a very positive thing. We've seen a, a, a real increase in people's confidence that people in the community can improve things around in, in their community around here when they want to. And you can see again across all population segments with the biggest positive shift among really the most disadvantaged group in the community, the disengaged battlers. Uh, so that's something we've we've done some more polling in the, uh, in, on this question in recent weeks. And again, it's uh, it's increased further. So where that all comes together is uh, our conclusion is that there is a surprising amount of common ground where you've got agreement from more than three and four people around a frustration uh, with division, uh, a sense of pride in very similar things, the NHS, our countryside, local community, a little less around our history, um, but strong uh, agreement, pride in becoming a more modern and diverse nation. Um, a, a sense of wanting change, uh, needing to protect the countryside and climate, give more power to local communities, and a, a lot of commonality around values as well. So that gives us a sense of the um, where there is common ground. Just two more things that I want to say. Um, one is that, and it's a caveat, while there is a lot of common ground, we do need to find a way to listen to each other better and be careful about projecting our views onto other parts of the population. So when we say, for example, that there is concern about the climate, which is widely shared among in, across the population, it's not the same the way that a progressive activist, which I have to say overwhelmingly uh, in the academic community, for example, people are progressive activists and, or, or civic pragmatists and that sort of more left end of the spectrum. It's not the same as everybody sharing the same perspective and wanting to become vegans and dropping red meat and so forth. For a lot of people, the commonality around climate is also pride in countryside. It's wanting to preserve our rural way of life. And that's just one example. Give you another example on inequality. The common ground is, is like people do really feel four and five that there's a problem, serious problem with inequality in the country. But if you just frame that as a, as a challenge of redistribution of uh, income from one group to another, you do lose quite a lot of support because the, the source, the real kind of common uh, agreement around the problem of inequality is that hard work isn't adequately rewarded. Only 13% of the population feel that people work hard are adequately rewarded. And so you need to have a story. When you think about how do you build common ground, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that you don't have a story of, re of redistribution by any means, but it's just understanding that there's nuance in the way in which you build common ground and people come at these issues with different values. And I think that, you know, as, as someone who in my uh, uh, younger years, I did all those courses like the Myers-Briggs and Ocean and so forth, and learnt to experience the fact that other people don't necessarily seem, see the world the same way as you do. And that's just true of populations as well. And one of the findings out of our research in the US is that um, uh, progressives or pe people who with uh, um, uh, postgraduate education actually have the worst understanding of the rest of the population um, than, than any other. That the more educated you become, the less you understand other people. And, and there is also a characteristic of people on the progressive side, particularly progressive activists, is that because they're so convinced of um, the rightness of their views, they're actually more judgmental than any other segment of the population um, of the views of others. Now, you'll say to me, well, that's because we're right, <laughs> to which I'll say, well, that's kind of the point, that's the problem. So understanding that there is a need for us to check ourselves and be better in listening to the, the reasons, the values base from which people come at these issues if we are to build social solidarity. Not everybody shares the same worldview. And I think that that's 
really important because uh, housing has segregated us more into our own communities. Obviously, the digital environment uh, separates us into like-minded communities. And the consequence of that is that we, we think that the, the world, surely everybody else thinks in the same way as I do. There's a sort of confirmation bias from the, the information worlds that each of us are in. And finding ways to get us, it's a bit, you know, the goggle box program. Uh, it's a great example of there's a, you know, a way to, there are, there are a few ways that we hear the voices of people who are not like us. And I think Goggle Box is, a, is an example of something in popular culture in Britain that actually does that quite well. But in our own social environments, for many of us, we can make the wrong judgments about where the solidarity or where the common ground is because we don't have enough diversity of experience uh, across divides. Um, so that's a, um, uh, just a point as a sort of checking uh, our, our assumptions that we might make. Um, and lastly, um, just to say that when you, um, when you think about where we end up and what the long-term effect in terms of social solidarity is, or in terms of COVID is on social solidarity, I think the biggest issue is going to be the story that we tell ourselves. There's a great book that's recently come out um, by Mark Steers called um, Out of the Ordinary. And it's a book that talks about the era of polarization division between the 20s, 30s going into the 1940s. And it sort of says, you know, there was this time when the conservatism was very backwards looking and wanted to recreate the world of the 19th century. The progressives were very intellectual, Marxist uh, kind of influence and really didn't like the lives of ordinary people. And there was a sort of a sense of politics felt disconnected from ordinary people. And what, what changed that environment and became very important in the memory that was preserved out of the war, wartime experience, was that a group of creatives of artists, intellectuals, writers, people like um, George Orwell, Dylan Thomas, uh, um, uh, J.B. Priestley, Barbara Johnson, uh, were, they elevated the lives of ordinary people and they reconnected us to a sense of pride in this sort of everyday human dignity in a way that sort of got beyond politics and built a sense of solidarity. And, what that meant was when the war came along, that the story that we told ourselves around the Blitz and, and subsequently, which remains powerful even now, uh, you know, generations later, it stuck with us because it was a story about people and the dignity of ordinary people that wasn't about the, the, just the political issues. And he makes a point that it's a remarkable thing. The memory of the Second World War is so framed by the, the, the Blitz experience, not, not something, not the war itself, but actually the experience of community and, and uh, um, solidarity uh, that came out. And of course, it was then Beverage Report and the, 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 the post-war construction of the welfare state very much came out of that sense of social solidarity. And the conclusion he draws from that is that this is kind of what we need now as well, is this going back to reconnection with the lives of ordinary people. And I think that that's something that really strikes me as true, having listened to so many of the conversations with people across Britain in the last year, that they're not talking about politics as much, they're not talking about policy issues, they're talking about their lives, but they're also talking about feeling looked down on uh, by politicians, by media, by people in authority, by academics, about two thirds across all of those groups, um, people feel looked down to. And I think that finding a way that builds a, a story of our commonality that gives everybody in our community a sense of a place and a sense of uh, recognition and dignity and celebrates the ordinary is a way through that can build something out of the experience of the, the pandemic and something that can help us to tackle the big, the many big issues that, that, that we confront. I'll leave it there. Well, thank you very much. Um, as I said, we're just going to move straight on now to Professor Pickett, and then at the end we'll we'll take questions. So if you've just joined us more recently, do remember if you've got some questions, put them in the chat just saying who you are and where you're from, and we'll pick them out at the end. Professor Pickett. Thanks very much, Robin, and, and, and thanks, Tim. That's that's tough act to follow, a lot there to to digest, but I think I think the order we're going in is good because you've really set the scene for us on, on a lot of what, what's really going on in Britain and, and some, some, some numbers that I think we can learn a lot, a lot from. So what I'm gonna try and do in, in my bit of time is I think give you my perspective from three different angles, um, quite apart from me being a progressive activist, which um, I definitely sign up to be, but 
Um, first, sort of the perspective of being a social epidemiologist and having, having that perspective on what solidarity means, but then also um, a perspective that comes from the work that I've been doing through the pandemic locally. I've been part of a COVID-19 scientific advisory group to Bradford and Airedale because I do a lot of research in Bradford with families, families with children. But through the pandemic, we've actually been sort of pivoting all of our, our research capacity to try and understand the impact of the pandemic on people's lives. So not really trying to understand um, the epidemiology of the virus, but trying to understand the epidemiology of lockdown and the responses to, to the pandemic. So that's taught us a lot. And that's been both survey work and qualitative work, you know, talking to people. And then since October, I've been, as, as Robin said at the beginning, I've been chairing the Greater Manchester Independent Inequalities Commission, which has been set up to advise the combined authority on how it can tackle inequalities to enhance its recovery from the pandemic. So lots of engagement in Greater Manchester, in that city region, um, with all kinds of groups around their experiences um, of COVID. But I think the first thing I want to say is that I think Tim's point that we're still in this is a really important one. We're not, we're not done yet with the pandemic. We're not through the other side. Um, we're not into the recovery period yet. And so some of the lessons we might be drawing or some of the things we might be thinking at the moment, they still might shift. And I think that's an important thing just to sort of remember this afternoon. So firstly, from, from the perspective of, so, of a social epidemiologist, solidarity matters, right? So solidarity matters for the health and well-being of populations. We know that when areas, communities have high levels of social capital, that their health and well-being is better. Um, we know that for individuals, if they are socially connected, their health is better. So social support matters for health. Friendship matters for health. I mean, in fact, friendship is, is so important for health that if we look at people over um, a 15 year follow-up period in prospective cohort studies, having friends is as protective of your health as smoking is bad for it. So, so we've got really robust evidence on, on social isolation, on loneliness being bad for health, on friendship and social support being good. And then in communities and at community level, social capital being really important for people's health and well-being. And when I'm talking about health and well-being, I'm talking about mental health and physical health. You know, both of those things are affected um, by solidarity. And then we know that social solidarity is stronger in more equal societies. So again, that's, that's a well-known relationship, you know, based, based on robust data. People are more willing to look out for their neighbors, help other people out, um, feel friendly towards groups who are different from them in more equal societies than they are in more unequal ones. And, and that's, I think, an important thing to remember through the pandemic because we have got very, very different experiences of COVID-19 in different countries. And although it's too early really to know how the whole thing will play out, there are some early indications that more unequal societies have done less well in responding to COVID-19. Um, a few papers, you know, starting, starting to come out linking income inequality to rates of excess deaths, for example. So we are not yet playing the blame game as an end game, but I think we will at some point be pausing, looking back and saying, you know, why did some countries have such higher death rates than others? Why did some countries respond less well? Why in some countries were the public more responsive to the COVID-19 restrictions that their government wanted to impose. And I think all of those questions will have to be answered at, at some point, but we're not, we're not yet ready to do that. But the level of inequality 
that countries took into the pandemic, I think is going to be an important part of answering those questions and, and understanding those cross national differences in experiences of the pandemic. And trust, you know, trust in people that, that you don't know, trust in, in the generalized other. Again, it's a really critical thing for population health and well being that we know is affected by inequality. Um, so that's, that's my sort of social epidemiologist perspective on the role that income inequality and social solidarity sort of play in creating different levels of health and well-being in, in populations. And that's the sort of context in which COVID has then sort of come among us. So over the last year, I think we have seen within the pandemic, quite an epidemic of social solidarity breaking out. Now that was very apparent early on in the UK. You know, we saw amazingly positive examples of communities getting together to help one another out, of neighbors helping neighbors, of people looking out for each other and looking after each other. And in that first lockdown from 23rd of March, last year. I think that was a very striking phenomenon and there was a lot written about it and a lot said about it. So we all stood outside on our doorsteps on a Thursday and, and we clapped for the NHS and we clapped for our key workers. People were getting together in their communities and really asking practical questions about what they could do for one another and for their neighbours. So we saw people setting up community food hubs where they hadn't been before. Or we saw people um, setting up systems so they could make sure that people were being, um, not, but not being socially isolated, were having some contact. People would go and get your prescriptions for you, you know, if you were shielding and, and, and couldn't go out. Um, people were volunteering in, in, in vast numbers to, to do what they could. And, and that has gone on to some extent. So we've seen, um, in Manchester, volunteers helping to take vaccines to the homeless, for example. And certainly, I, mean, I think food has been a, a particular issue through the pandemic where we've seen communities come together and, and really try to do good things. But I think the picture is, is really much more complex than that, than that sounds. And I think it is something to do with, with what Tim was talking about, being shaped by class and by socioeconomic differences and, and by where you live and what kind of um, class you come from. So I think for lots of middle class people, there have been positive experiences of community solidarity through lockdown that perhaps have been a surprise to them and they're really, really welcomed. In my village, I live between York and, and Tadcaster in the north of England. Nobody used to talk to each other much in our village. Um, you know, if you went for a walk, you might sort of say hello to somebody. But we now have a village WhatsApp group on which people talk all the time. I mean, try stopping them. You know, there's an awful lot of chat and gossip and nice things and people offering their tomato plants and people offering to do shopping for each other. You know, that, that experience is very, very positive. But I don't think that's been the experience of an awful lot of communities through lockdown. So with the families that we've been talking to in Bradford, that sense of neighbourly solidarity has not really been coming through in our qualitative work. So we did ask people, we have asked people about the positive aspects of lockdown. You know, we've not assumed that everything about lockdown is, is, is bad or difficult. And people do talk to us a lot about how nice it has been to have time with family, the families that they are with in lockdown. Um, how enjoyable it is to have more time with their children, for example, even if it's been a struggle to manage homeschooling and a job at the same time. So lots, lots of people feeling a sort of within family solidarity, but, 
in, a, in our work there, families weren't really talking about this sort of neighborhood solidarity, this neighborhood sort of sense of community, because I think for families, it's just been heads down. There has just been so much to do. So I think your capacity to feel that social solidarity and to engage with it yourself is very much shaped by where you live and your age and whether you have children at home and you're trying to homeschool. So I don't think everybody's experience of solidarity has been the same. And I also think that, of course, the economic impact of COVID has been quite different across the British population, even though we've had furlough and we've had um, other things to sort of try and underpin people's economic well-being. And when you're worried about money and job security, that takes up an awful lot of mental space. So again, in our families in Bradford, many of whom were furloughed, um, they were struggling about issues to do with financial security. Because if you entered this epidemic with a livelihood that was just enough, you know, you were getting by and you were fine and it was just enough, 80% of just enough is not enough. And if you've now spent a whole year as a family with 80% of just enough, you're in a very different position now, a year into the pandemic than you were at the start of it. So people are accumulating debt, they're accumulating worry, and they're accumulating strain. And when all of that is going on, then it's, it's harder to actually think about these solidarity issues, I think, and to have the capacity for those sorts of things. And what I do worry about going forward is the competition that there is going to be for employment in a post-COVID world and what that is going to do to our sense of solidarity across different communities as well. The other thing I wanted to mention was around the kinds of solidarity that are not positive. And if we are getting together and feeling a shared sense of purpose in providing food for our neighbors or in supporting our NHS, or helping one another out in, in a certain way, that's a very positive thing. But I think we have also seen examples throughout the pandemic of social solidarity around things that are negative. Um, I was struck the other day watching a group of people, I think in Idaho in the United States, who were gathering together in solidarity to burn masks. And they were standing around a bonfire and applauding one another and communing and, and they were getting a lot of social solidarity out of that event, but they were burning face masks. And the other kind of solidarity I think we've seen that is negative has been around that, that misinformation. So communities of what we might call misunderstanding. So people whose shared connection to one another is through the exchange of conspiracy theories, for example, or is through the exchange of misinformation about the safety of the vaccine. So that we see um, areas of the country, and I think the report in The Guardian this morning, um, where we can see that certain communities have got much lower coverage of the vaccination as it's being rolled out. And we know that some of that is to do with vaccine hesitancy that is coming about through shared, um, shared information that from our perspective, we would see as misinformation and misunderstanding. And so that kind, that kind of solidarity is not progressive and that kind of solidarity is not helpful for us um, coming out of this pandemic with health and well-being for everybody and building, building a strong economy. And although I think Tim is right, there has been so far a quite remarkable absence of blame directed upwards at the government. That might come later, but I think, I think that's right, that understanding of, well, it's a really difficult thing they're having to do. There's a lot of difficult choices they're having to make. There's a lot they're having to balance. I think that's true. 
we have at times seen hints of downwards blame towards what are no longer sort of the undeserving poor, but maybe they're the undeserving super spreaders. The idea that um, people who live in um, certain communities, people who work in certain jobs, people who live in certain kinds of houses are not behaving in the ways that the country needs them to behave to um, contain the pandemic and sort of hints of, of blame coming through there. Actually, it's not been strident, but there's been enough of it there um, to worry me about people breaking lockdown rules, about people needing to sort of continue to, to behave in positive ways and not always a great understanding of some people's needs to actually keep on going out to work or some people's reluctance to stay at home and isolate if they're told that they've had a positive COVID test because actually they cannot afford to do anything else. So there have been bits, bits bubbling up, I think, around, around those issues that we need to keep an eye on. And I was a bit depressed the other day to see that there was a real, quite a large proportion of the British population who felt that people who had lost their jobs during the pandemic deserved to do so. Um, so that, that's a sort of countervailing statistic to some of the more positive ones that, that Tim's shared with us. So what, what does our experience of the pandemic tell us about, about solidarity and, and where we're going? I think, you know, some of the statistics that, that Tim showed us are very positive. You know, we haven't got that bifurcation, that, that division um, that they've got in the United States around what should be done about COVID or what should be done about economic recovery. We are seeing a, a groundswell, I think, of public opinion in, in favour of changing things, of not going back to the old normal, of building back better. But how is that actually going to translate into policies that actually create more of that positive solidarity um, more of that positive and progressive change. We've been clapping the NHS. A lot of people volunteered to support the NHS, but when push came to shove in the budget the other week, we decided not to reward the NHS um, beyond a 1% pay rise. We've heard a lot about levelling up, you know, and the need to reduce inequalities across the UK by region. And then what did we see in the budget? We saw money for the Tory towns and, and not money um, that was truly going to level up those differences between North and South and between different areas of the country. And what have we seen repeatedly from this government is actually a sort of clumsy lack of empathy and so the need to U-turn consistently on things like feeding um, poorer children during the school holidays. So, so it feels like we get a, a sort of wall of lack of empathy. And then that wall is only broken down by pressure from outside that actually then manages to make the government pivot in a way that is more empathetic or that is more promoting a social solidarity. Um, we saw Jacob Rees-Mogg saying that he didn't think that um, an international charity should be helping support food provision for children in Britain. Um, again, a sort of lack of empathy and a lack of understanding that, that most people in this country do want to make sure that most children are fed most of the time. So, so I think that there's a real sense of reading the mood wrong at the top that's happening again and again and again. And again in that budget, no investment in social infrastructure and it's social infrastructure that supports solidarity. So I think that that was a real missed opportunity. Tim finished by um, talking about his experience of talking to people across the country across the past year and, and the strong sense coming through from people um, of being looked down on by people who are making decisions on their behalf. Um, a lack of respect, I think, flowing downwards from politicians and from policymakers to the public. 
And that's been my experience as well in the work I've been doing across Greater Manchester. People feeling a real wish to be more involved in, in politics, more involved in local decision-making, more involved in, in what happens in their communities. And they're willing to take the solidarity that they have experienced during the pandemic. They're willing to take that and turn that into something more permanent, I think. And we need, just need to figure out the mechanisms by which we do that. And, and I think the extent to which we can spread more, more deliberative democracy in this country, get more involvement and make it meaningful for people, the more chance we have of grabbing the solidarity produced by the pandemic, turning this moment that we're all talking about as another post-1945 moment into something really concrete and that will last. So I'm going to stop there and I'm really looking forward to um, the question and answer session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks to both our speakers for some very stimulating comments. I'm just going to start by asking you each a question and then we'll um, canvas uh, some questions from the audience. Um, I fear I might have said the wrong thing to everyone earlier. I think it's the Q&A function you have to use to put your questions in and actually not the chat function. So if you can just, um, if you've got a question just poised there or if you've put it in the chat function, please also put it in the Q&A function. So let me just um, let me just start. Actually, take this last point that we just heard from Kate, but direct it to Tim, which is that there's some. I mean, there's widespread discussion that suggests that it's somehow like the aftermath of the Second World War, and and, and you both, towards the end of your comments, alluded to that. And Tim, I, I just wanted to sort of ask you a bit more about that, but in the following context. I mean, the the standard way of thinking about that process after the Second World War comes from Richard Titmus here at the LSE, and he, he talks about it as a, as a social solidarity that emerged from a particular set of circumstances in which people were thrown together with people that they usually were not involved with, and in which in that environment they faced great uncertainty and risk far more than they normally did. And in that context, he says, people were prepared to... Um, you know, move ahead with the welfare state and various egalitarian measures. Now, I just wanted to ask you whether your data enables us to have any purchase on that, noting that really there's two different arguments there. I mean, the first argument's about being thrown together, but in a sense, during the pandemic, we've all been separated from each other. So it doesn't look obviously that that's applicable. The other, of course, is that there's this dramatic uncertain risk. Well, that sounds a bit more plausible because we are all susceptible, just we don't know where the bomb's going to land, we don't know who's going to get the virus. So could you possibly reflect on that analogy and, and consider whether your data has some bearing on whether we are in that kind of Titmus-like post-war situation? It's hard to make the comparison because obviously the um, uh, the easiest way, I mean, you're, you're comparing different sort of modalities, comparing the history in that time to the kind of uh, social research uh, methodologies that we have now. Um, so, you you know, in a sense, you don't have a, it's not easy to, to, to compare. I mean, what is similar, obviously, is a big shared experience that we, you know, is going to uh, shape our memories and shape uh, um, shape the way that we see this period in our own lives for many years to come. And there's a, there's a, there's a lot of shared experience. It's just, it is very unusual in a historical sense for a whole population or uh, most of the population to have shared experiences. I mean, if you think of something like the 2012 Olympics, you have these moments that can be quite short and they are really important. I mean, they bring people together in significant ways. This is this long extended thing. It has, elements of, uh, of grief and tragedy uh, and, and incredible loss and pain. Um, it has, you know, has all the effects on mental health. It has, you know, there's, a, there's a many dimensions to it. Um, but I mean, I, I guess um, in part, it depends how we emerge, obviously, and it goes to many issues that Kate was just talking uh, to, but it also goes to the, you know, what part, what memory we preserve from this shared experience. And I guess that's the that's the thing that's really struck me in the um, the account that I was mentioning from uh, Mark Steer's book, where you 
you realize, oh, there's actually like quite a conscious creation of memory, even during the war. I mean, the fact that Bill Brandt, for example, the photographer who's famous for the, um, the many of the images that you associate with the war from the, the moonlight uh, photo of um, St. Paul's uh, with that sort of foreground of all destruction through to the, the pictures of um, people sleeping down the bottom of the, the underground. Um, stations across London. And he makes a really interesting point. He said, like, all the conventional photographers were going down there at five o'clock in the evening when people were, um, the men were coming in their suits and they were sort of eating their food in their suits and they all looked very prim and proper. And that was the traditional view of who we were as a people. Uh, and what Bill Brandt did was stay there until midnight and take photos of people in the messiness of the human suffering and just the just the, the reality of a whole lot of people squashed down there, uh, you know, to save their lives. And because it was this raw humanity and it had real texture to it, it's something that people, people related to. And it was a story that gave dignity to everybody and gave everybody a place in that story of how they were coming together. And I do think that that's a key part of what the future needs to look like for us. Um, it's, I think it's a, it could be, I mean, if you look at the World Bank, I think it's World Bank or IMF, the very recent research, okay, uh, will be probably more aware than I am of it, but just talks about how five years after a pandemic in most societies, inequality has grown. So I, I think that the default, <clears throat> absent any in intervention is, uh, things probably get worse coming out of this, this experience, but you have the ingredients here for a different story and a, a, a very significant part of that of how what determines the pathway isn't just about us saying, well, the government needs to do this, the government needs, needs to do that. The government does need to do a lot. And there are a lot of expectations on the government. And if the levelling up agenda doesn't deliver, I think it, there's, a, there's devastating risks to our democracy because um, you know, there's a lot of people who are banking on things are really going to change and that, they, they, that they're going to get. So that's one element. But at the end of the day, the biggest transformation of a community happens when people demand it and when they build it from, from the grassroots. And I think what this moment has given us is uh, it's not just the fact that it's not just the shared experience. It's the other thing that's really struck me in a lot of the conversations, and I don't know, Kate, if you've had the same thing, but the number of people who've said, this has made me think about what's important in life. And they talk about community, they talk about family, they talk about reconnecting with nature. And that's really interesting. Um, people are reflective. And there is, a, there is an opportunity for leadership in this moment in our institutions, uh, in local communities, and absolutely in politics as well, to think about how we can change and bring the best out of this experience, but also tackle the worst and deal with some of the some of the worst parts of our, our inequalities and divisions that have also been exposed um, in the last year. Thanks very much. Um, so, Kate, can I just um, stick on the theme of thinking about the aftermath of the, the Second World War, um, but in, in, a, in a slightly different way? I mean, you know, towards the end you said, well, there's a great desire to build back better. And, and you emphasised, I think, that the esteem in which key workers were held or are held has somehow increased. But the point I want to ask you to reflect on is, is it not the case that the labour market power of those workers has, if anything, decreased? And that this is really a, a major difference I mean, in the aftermath of the Second World War, there were major labour shortages. Now everyone's on furlough and going to come back. And I suppose the larger point is it's, of course, true what story we tell ourselves. And it's, of course, true that change only comes if people demand it. But it also only comes if they've got the capacity to act on those demands and to pursue them. And is it in the case that there's a more pessimistic situation here in which key workers, for all the esteem that they've gained, don't actually have the capacity to push hard to better their situation? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a huge risk, isn't it? So we did learn early on in the pandemic, I think, to value certain kinds of work in ways that we hadn't valued it previously. Health workers 
is, is the obvious one, but also care providers, of course, mm. but also the people who are stocking our supermarket shelves. Um, so key, key, key workers who we probably didn't value ever before in the same way. And then I think there are all the workers in sectors that may go completely to the wall. You know, what's going to happen to high street retail after the pandemic? Are we ever going to go back to high street shops? What's going to happen to the hospitality industry? Is that ever going to recover? Or are we just going to keep on um, ordering ordering takeaways and, and that sort of thing? So, so all of that shift in, in, in the structure of the labor market, we don't yet know how that's going to play out. Plus, we're likely to have a an economic sort of falling off a cliff time. Plus, there's all the stuff that was going on previously that we worried about that now we don't seem to be talking about anymore, which is the automation of jobs um, and the need for us perhaps to shift to um, a shorter working week. All, all of those kinds of conversations that were about the changing world of work and the third industrial revolution, they've all been shunted aside but those chickens are going to come home to roost probably right at the same time that, that the recession starts to bite and, and we start to see more layoffs of, of workers who have been furloughed and we start to see the collapse of certain kinds of business and certain sectors following the pandemic. And so, yes, people's um, labour market power is going to be reduced, I think. So that is a risk. So so it's, it's a weird... Mm division isn't it between us as as a society having sort of learned to value certain groups of workers and yet it looks like we're not actually going to manage to protect their interests very well unless we we start doing it right away and we start doing it very very consciously okay listen thank you both very much so um we've got some questions from the audience now and I, i'm just going to put the first one Possibly to both of you, I think. Um, so Susan Wolfe, a retired uh, social historian from London, asks that what I've observed, she says, starting last spring, is the increased rudeness and overt nastiness in queues, in shops, etc., which has been shocking at times and not what I expected. And I, I guess um, both of you alluded in part to how things had changed over time. And, and here's a sort of very graphic, someone's experiencing that in a quite a graphic way. Um, could you perhaps comment on that and in the process consider why there has, if there has been a change over time in this regard? Perhaps start with you, Tim. Uh, in, this is an area where the, uh, the values segmentation that we've done with the British population is uh, particularly interesting because it's, um, uh, there's a group called the disengaged traditionalists. They're actually the largest segment of the population, about 18%. Um, and I'd kind of describe them as the curtain twitchers. They're a group who, uh, they actually don't have a very strong, they, they tend to look at other people's individual behavior really strongly and they, they expect dysfunction and they get frustrated by it. And they're interesting because they, they're kind of working class Tories a little bit, but they're really interesting on uh, recycling, for example. They complain about so the person across the road hasn't re has mixed their paper with their bottles, and you know they, they're they're really interesting behaviourally. What they watch out for is they, they're against handouts, for example, uh, welfare benefits. So they're really conscious of individual. So what was interesting with this group is um, they got really really positive um, in the initial months after the the lockdown because they. And what I learned from listening to them and sitting through groups, because it's a sort of fascinating and quite different group to my makeup and a lot of people in my social environment, is that they genuinely uh, think that most other people are bad and uh, can't be trusted and that the world is a dangerous place. And that uh, so when, when they saw people behaving, behaving responsibly, smiling across the street, uh, standing back when they walked into a shop, all of those sorts of things. They actually responded genuinely really well. Um, later on, uh, and sort of going into the, the end of last year, there was a real shift um, within that group, especially. I don't know how much it was actually that they were seeing individual, the, the, what uh, Susan mentions, the sort of discourtesy. They were certainly picking it up in the media. Uh, and they were sort of feeling like, oh, it's all changed and like people are going back to their worst behaviour. Um, 
I think by and large, the story across the whole population is that people have been positively surprised by the, the genuine goodness of others' uh, behaviour, kindness. They've seen lots of initiatives like the village initiative that uh, Kate mentioned. So by and large, it's actually been more positive um, story. But of course, there is. There are, there are people who are, who are rude and careless and, and so on. Um, what it strikes me is that um, we have a tendency in our media to exaggerate the worst behaviour. And you would have thought that there were huge numbers of people who were locked down sceptics. And I mentioned those numbers. Only 5% of country think that they've actually been a positive force in the last year. So I would actually say that the larger picture of the whole of society has been a shift towards more pro-social behaviour and being more considerate. But I absolutely agree. Of course, there is. There are some, uh, you know, there is dysfunction. What, partly what we've got to think about in our media environment is getting the right balance there because, you know, media and, and business models, I mean, let's hope that with GB News and, you know, new entrance into the media landscape in the UK, we don't get the creation of that you know, disinformation environment that has driven division so much in the US, where it's like always focused on dysfunction and often taking really small, you know, gr groups that are unrepresentative of any part of the country and saying, this is the, the threat to all of us, uh, because I think that's, that, that is particularly dangerous. I think overall the story has actually been a relatively positive one. Hey, thanks. So, Kate, yeah, on the same point about how things may or may not have changed and why. Yeah, I was feeling really sorry for Susan, actually. She also said in the Q&A that, that nobody was clapping around her <laughs> on Thursday nights. Um, I, think, I think it is important to remember that, especially through probably, you know, March through May, June, a lot of people were very, very frightened in this country, a lot of people were really fearful of catching COVID. And that, that has dissipated to a great extent, partly because so many of people are now vaccinated, partly because infection rates are coming down. But there was a period of time when, when there was really tangible fear. Um, and it was sensible for some people to be very fearful of being near other people. And I think some of the rudeness and some of the intolerance and the sort of self-righteousness that crept in came, came from that place of fear. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of think about that. But I think Tim's right. There is a, another kind of self-righteousness and about sort of pointing the finger at other people's behavior that is not coming from, from a place of fear. And I think that's the one that we need to sort of fear politically and fear being kind of ratcheted up by media, by social media. You know, this idea that, that other people behave badly and other people um, are not complying with the things that are need, need to happen to, to make a better society. That's the one I think we really need to, to be cautious about. Okay, thanks very much. So I've got another question here from Vivek Srivastava um, from London. And the question says, is there any suggestion that the rise in social solidarity during the pandemic has given rise to more collective forms of action? And um, the questioner refers to the Black Lives Matter protests and last week's um, vigil for Sarah Everard. So, um, yeah, Kate, maybe we'll start and ask you about that. Well, I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement existed before COVID and it existed before the death of, of George Floyd, of course, but we saw that massive resurgence of it during 2020, accompanied by a, a really widespread desire of people to protest visibly, you know, to be on the street, to be having their voices heard, to be in solidarity with one another while they made that protest. So I think that that was COVID um, amplified in a way. So we saw a community that had been shown to be experiencing a much higher rate of infection, a much higher rate of um, severe illness if they were infected and a much higher death rate 
a, a community that was actually overrepresented in those key jobs that were needed to keep keep the rest of us sort of functioning and alive and, and, and surviving. And we saw how much they were already sharply affected by inequalities of all kinds, including health inequalities before COVID. And then on top of that, we saw that level of police violence continuing to sort of spill out um, and affect those communities. So it doesn't surprise me at all that we saw more desire to get out there and be public and, and protest. Um, so COVID, I think, probably did give, give an amplification to the Black Lives Matter um, protests that, that Mm. it's who knows who knows what tip things and trigger things the police in america have been killing black people at higher rates than they should for an awful long time why was it that death that suddenly created that moment where people actually wanted to demand change in a different way we'll we'll never know but i suspect covid was a really a really big part of that with respect to the sarah Everard protests um, and, and the wish of women to be out there in solidarity with one another, protesting against male violence. I think we've seen um, an unfortunate response to that, actually. And I understand, you know, the concerns around, we are still in lockdown, we are still trying to protect people from, from transmission, we are still trying to make sure that, that the positive trends we've got of bringing transmission and death rates down don't suddenly get um, disrupted because of, 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 of other things. But I'm sure that that, that event, although those events could have been handled in a way that allowed for a COVID safe protest and allowed people sort of democratic wish to protest to, to, to be safely um, ensured. Are people wishing to protest more around those issues because of COVID? I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, um, so Tim, do you have any reflections on that collective action that may be strengthened by the social solidarity? I think there's some, I mean, I think on the, um, on the increased consciousness of violence against women, I think there is, there is also a connection just to the COVID experience, because as we know, there's been a really significant increase in violence against women, because the main source of that is the largest source of it is um, uh, partners, as male, male partners. So um, there is connection there. I mean, I think there's definitely there's a kind of um, yeah, people have been cooped up. So that's been that's been a factor in uh, across the, the different countries. There is another element. I think that I mean, I, we during the uh, Black Lives Matter protests in the in the US in the middle of last year, we were running a really interesting, or throughout the year actually, we were running an interesting panel of like a hundred. Uh, representative group of 100 Americans, we were engaging conversation with them every day, um, just about 10 minutes every day, things that were happening in the news. So it was just a kind of a conversation, sometimes about political issues, sometimes just about their lives. And so really quickly after the uh, after George Floyd's murder and the kind of that had the, the, the eruption of the response, uh, what struck me was just the difference. I, my expectation, I have to say, was that the conservatives um, and Republicans in that group would quickly default to a kind of police and order uh, frame on it. And they didn't at all. Some did, a pretty small proportion, but it was just such a widespread acknowledgement uh, among Americans um, of, the, uh, of, of the legacy of the, and, and the country has not dealt with its you know, profound history of, of racism and that the policing needs to change. And that was a really interesting moment to me. I think that people had just had a little bit more space to think um, in the experience of lockdown. It was also relatively early in lockdown. So that's maybe a little bit of a, a, a factor. But how much all of that is going to be enduring, I guess it, it's, it is hard to know. I mean, I do, I do feel like there has been a racial reckoning, uh, more so in the US than there has been in the UK, uh, but there has been some form of reckoning at the same time of the pandemic period. And it is yeah, it's perhaps sort of points to um, uh, some connection between the two. But the question is obviously is where, where do we land in a couple of years time? Thanks. So I have another question here from Duncan Reed, who is an alumnus of Birkbeck College. And um, the questioner asks about how the solidarity spirit fits 
with the differencing approach that the constituent nations of the UK have demonstrated. And uh, the, the suggestion of the question, I think, is that in some sense, the different nations have been trying to upstage each other or at least upstage Westminster government. So, um, Kate, do you have some reflections on that? I mean, of course, you're not really dealing with a national constituent with your Greater Manchester um, review, but nevertheless, it's a, a sub-national level of government activity. As someone said to me the other day, and um, he didn't want to be, <laughs> he didn't want to ever sort of get out or be quoted, and he said, you know, politics really is sort of a beauty competition. Um, and, and it is always competitive, you know, can, can I get attention to, to my political point of view? So this idea that the different nations of the UK might be trying to upstage one another, I don't know, but, you know, it's, it's plausible. I don't know. I don't, I don't really have the, have the expertise to be able to, to speak to that. They've clearly taken quite different approaches through the pandemic and they have stressed different things. I would say that looking at Scotland and Wales, I think they've leaned more towards health protection than economy protection, but there haven't been vast differences across the UK. I and mean, we've seen differences in timing of lockdowns or restrictions or differences of coming out of them. But I think actually it's been a, it's, it's been a fairly consistent picture. I mean, what we know about Wales and, and Scotland is that they are both self-declared well-being economies you know, they have dis made decisions um, in the recent past to focus on promoting well-being and that well-being should be the primary goal of all of their strategy rather than GDP growth. So that might be underpinning or driving, you know, some of some of their decisions in Scotland. That's very much around that sort of inclusive economy push in Wales. It's very much around their um protection of future generations and, and act and so so they do come from different places and I think it's not always about upstaging one another it is about devolution having given those different places the possibility of doing things differently to Westminster and representing their populations um, differently and taking them on a, on a different path yeah, thanks. So, so Tim, can I just frame the same question? But I mean, in, in light of what your data was showing, that people wanted devolution, basically, or they wanted a greater, they wanted power to come closer to them. I mean, you might have thought again back after the Second World War, you'd say, well, government was legitimated by the experience of handling the war. But here it's more complicated because which level of government is legitimated and one, one part of government is trying to break off from another part of government and so on. So how, how do you think your data bears on this question or um, that the questioner has asked? Well, I think that, I mean, it's particularly the case in the, um, the Metro mayors, they've found their place, haven't they? Uh, they've received uh, a, a sort of a prominence um, that they've never had before. And I think it sort of makes the case for um, the, the devolution, um, as with the devolved nations as well. I mean, I think one general takeout that's consistent, that's consistent across all of our countries, actually, is there is just more trust uh, in the levels of, in whatever level of government is closer to you. Um, and that's because I think, you know, the countries where we're focused, I mean, they're not, local government isn't, isn't corrupt and ineffective. It's genuinely kind of more connected to communities and it's more, more ordinary people um, uh, are, are in those levels of government than, than in uh, Westminster. Um, so I think it's, it's a reflection that communities become more important. The, that sense of kind of protection for the local community and representation of the local communities become more important. Um, you know, the other thing I'd say, which is interesting looking at our uh, UK research is just how much there, uh, on all the issues that relate to the constitutional settlement, there's a great deal of difference, particularly among in Scotland, for example. But actually, if you once you get into issues beyond that, there is so much common ground. I mean, we are so we are so similar. There just aren't fundamental differences in people's views on most issues. And so it's an interesting story of, I think, 
there is common ground that is a good news story actually about the, the whole country, but government uh, and authority just and institutions need to be closer to people and less remote. And you, we can only, I think that's essential if we're gonna rebuild trust. And so it's probably been a good time for this moment is if you think about the sort of the long-term trajectory of how the constitutional sort of settlement is changing, I think that this marks, this will be seen as a milestone in that evolution um, and, uh, and, and should be in a more positive way. And in reality, what that also means is, uh, you know, to Kate's point about how much change is really taking place, you know, you look at the way that the funds are being structured, the levelling up funds, it's like, are they really giving power to local communities? Or is it still a model of uh, centralising the decision making in Westminster and then sort of handing out uh, buckets to, to different communities? What people want to see is actually some uh, return of power and some sort of shift. And I think that the the way that, it, you know, for the future of the, the union, the only way that Scotland is ultimately going to be held within the union is with a new settlement that, that actually involves a, a, you know, more of that power being localised. But arguably, that's also what's needed, you know, for, for England as well. So this is, I think there's a story here that could kind of put those pieces together. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll just stick with you for a moment, Tim. So Samuel from the West Midlands, a PPE student at the Open University, asks a question about the media, and I'll just, I'll just pose the actual question at the end. Do you think the media has contributed more to polarisation or to solidarity, and have they behaved ethically? One thing that can get, be guaranteed to get you a lot of common ground in the UK is saying uh, critical things with the media. <laughs> it's remarkably how you ask, we ask the question, actually, what's the biggest cause of uh, division, drive, what drives division in our community? And the answer is political parties and the media and then social media um, as, as the top three. Um, so, no, I think that, I mean, that's, that's how media functions. However, what I would say is uh, in a comparative sense, um, the, the BBC is such an important institutional part of the structure of, of, a, of, of a kind of common ground Britain. It's so much, I mean, because I work in the US, the difference in not having reliable sources of information and everything being tribalized. And like, you know, it's not just on the right. I mean, if you look at what the way MSNBC is going now, it's, it's everybody's just falling into these tribes of polarization and their kind of different realities. And it's, it's so destructive because I, I feel if you look at the history of the US, it was really from the cable TV from Fox in the in the 90s, Newt Gingrich, uh, all of that was the moment when where we are now uh, really began. Um, we don't want to go in the same direction and the long term effect that changes in the media environment have are really, really profound. So um, I think the you know, while it's 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 a national pastime to be critical of the BBC in, in the UK, I actually think, you know, careful what you wish for, because and I think the BBC can do a lot better to be to better understand the whole population. Um, and it, it, it probably does too much reflect the perspectives of one part of the community, um, you know, the cosmopolitans, etc. And I think that's important to address that. But but like changing that could be very harmful. In terms of social media, which is now, you know, more and more the driver, more than the traditional media. Yeah, I mean, the same things are happening everywhere. A very small proportion of the population is active talking politics on social media, but it has a big impact. And that's a, that's a challenge that all societies, Global South, Global North, are dealing with. Um, and finding the ways to, you know, social media is so powerful in connecting us, as it has done during the pandemic, but finding the ways for those platforms to stop, you know, incentivizing um, uh, hate and division and the extremes and mis misrepresenting us uh, is a very, very important part of how we navigate through the, the 2020s. And I think one of the most positive agendas that the Biden administration has, it's less commented on, is wanting to do something about it. But, you know, you've now got, it, weirdly, actually, the potential for a cross-party um, co cooperation in the US um, to get more responsibility from the, the tech giants. It's a really, really important part of, the, of, of what this decade looks like. Thanks. Um, and to you, Kate, there's a question from Devon Ostrom, an alumni of the LSE in Toronto in Canada, um, who asks, in the post-pandemic world, how do we push back against the drive to forget? And the question refers to the Spanish flu and earlier instances um, 
Oh, oh you, you, <laughs> I'll just forget. Yeah. you don't have to go as far back as the Spanish flu, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I suppose the most the most recent sort of phenomenon like this has been the global financial crisis. You know, when when that was happening and we were in that moment. I think we all thought we we would see more change, more of a pivot, more more of a real shift in the way we um, did our economics, basically, and it didn't happen. So there was a lot of talk across the world about we'll never go back to the old way of doing the things. This has been a wake up call. You know, we'll make sure we do things differently. And you know, a few few years later, what had changed? Very very little. Uh, you know, what impact was there on inequalities? There wasn't any, you know, if, if anything, you know, we, we saw after a real little blip, the super rich get richer and richer and richer again. So what's the risk of that happening this time? Ugh. Devon, your guess is as good as mine. In in some ways, this is this is an event that has happened to people more personally, I would say. And, and to more of us. And so it's, it's possible that compared to the global financial crisis, we will do better of holding this in our collective memory and of deciding that we want to capitalize on this moment, moment for change and do things differently. But yeah, the Spanish flu. I mean, the thing to remember about pandemics is we will have another one. Um, it's inevitable. Since since the Neolithic, we've been having pandemics. It's just it's part of the settled human condition, um, and so we will have another one. So I guess the big question about coming out of this one is: Will we learn the lessons ahead of the next one that actually mean we are more resilient at the at the time that that happens? We've we said earlier early on that we're still in the middle of this one. We still haven't seen how this one is, is going to play out. And I was, I was looking at something just the other night actually about the first huge human epidemics. And, you know, there was one that hit Rome um, very early on and it's thought to have contributed to the, to the fall of the Roman empire. And I was looking at the dates of it and I was like, oh gosh, that was four years long. They had their pandemic for four years. Now mm -hmm. we've got a vaccination program, so I hope it won't go on quite as long as that but you know we are a year in and it's not it's not over yet um it's likely that COVID-19 will settle down to become an endemic disease in in human populations and we will cope with it as we cope with sort of winter flu and, and that sort of thing um and then yeah it's quite likely we will all just sort of forget how how serious this was and and some of the lessons but if we're sensible we will take this moment to think about the next pandemic and what we do to, to be more resilient then. And what this pandemic exposed to us more than anything were the socioeconomic and the health inequalities already here in this country, fracturing us, you know, dividing North from South, dividing ethnic minority populations from the other, dividing the old from the young, rich from poor, all of that got exposed um, to a sharper sort of light of day that, than it had been for a long time. So we need to seize that moment, I think, and, and see what we can do to repair and heal those fractures so that next time we don't end up being the country with the highest rate of excess deaths, you know, um, among rich developed countries and possibly everywhere. Listen, thank you very much. I think we're almost at the end of our time. Um, it's certainly true that there have been endemic um, pandemics through long periods of human history. And in fact, I think economic historians have established that some of these very profound pandemics, which killed off huge proportions of the population, actually paradoxically led to more equal outcomes for a number of generations, just simply because of the lack of labour. But we are fortunate that we're not in that situation, um, however horrendous the situation is we're in. And I'm very grateful to our two speakers for providing a kind of data-rich but also policy-oriented series of observations in the middle of an unfolding situation, which is always an invidious thing to do. It's a, it's a moving target, but it's a moving target that we've all very much got in our minds. And I think the overall message we've heard is that whilst there are unifying aspects of it and also aspects that are creating further division, 
both the speakers thought that at least in some respects the unifying aspects had some room to develop and move. And that is cause for some sense of optimism for those of us in and around um, the business of trying to improve the society or, as we say, to build back better. So thank you both to both our speakers, Professor Kate Pickett and to Tim Dixon, and thank you to the audience. All the best for now. Goodbye.